I think we can get started. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the panel on insect biodiversity. Um, just wanna give a little tech warning. Um, don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar, so you can see us, but we can't see you. And there's a Q&A function, so you can submit your questions. The panelists will be stopping at the end of each of their presentations to take any questions that have come in. So feel welcome to submit your questions as early as you like, um, but we'll also be answering questions at the end as well. Um, just CLE information, this is a CLE accredited panel, so I'll be distributing the link um, that has all of the information that you'll need to have if you want to register for that. Also, there will be a link for Friends of Land, Air, Water um, if you want to donate. Um, that fund um, contributes to students doing um, nonprofit work at environmental um, nonprofits over the summer. So that's a really important source of funding for us. Um, I'll drop that link in the Q&A at some point in this panel and you can access it that way. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Oh, let me just put that link down real quick. Oh, great. Um, our co-host Beck has put it in the Q&A so you can access it that way. Um, okay, so my name is Karen Gay. Um, I run panels at Land Air Water. I'm also the Whaley Apprentice, so that means I work on our annual zine. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order that they'll present. So first we'll have Craig Peace. Um, Craig Peace is a scientist. He is um, an author at the Science and Law column at the Inter Environmental Forum. He published scientific, his published scientific papers range from Yellowstone grizzly bears to paleontology to the population ecology of obscure plants. He has degrees in biology and engineering from UCLA, a doctorate in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago, and did a postdoc post in applied math at the Wiseman Institute of Science. He was on the UT Austin science faculty for 12 years before spending two decades as a law professor. He is currently professor of science and law without portfolio. Then we have Roel Van Klink. Dr. Roel Van Klink did his undergraduate and MSc work at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and his PhD at the University of Groningen, also in the Netherlands on insect conservation and agricultural landscapes. He did a postdoc research in the ne Netherlands, Switzerland and Czech Republic, and is currently a postdoc at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research in Leipzig, Germany. His work also focuses on long-term changes in insect assemblages. Um, then Tar um, Christine Auckland and Tara Cornelisa will be presenting together. Christine Auckland is a staff attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity's Endangered Species Program, where she works to defend the Endangered Species Act and protect species from extinction. Christine got her undergraduate degree in biology from Northern Arizona University and her law degree from the University of Montana. She says that being able to use the law to advance science is one of the best aspects of her job. She lives on territories of the Salish and Kalispell people in what is known as Missoula, Montana. And Tara Cornelisi is a senior scientist at the Endangered Species Program at the Center for Biological Diversity, where she spearheads the Saving the Insects campaign. She has a PhD in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And now I would like to turn the panel over to Professor Peace. Thank you all. Uh, welcome. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me uh, okay? Welcome. Apparently there's a share screen button here that I've got to find. It might be at the bottom of your Zoom application. 
Uh, okay. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, is that, uh, can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, let me try again. Uh, <laughs> I thought, I just hit share screen. Um, oh, it's not on mute. <sighs> oh, select something you wanna share, okay. How about that? And um, we can see your screen now. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Um, sorry about the delays. Um, welcome to this panel on uh, insect conservation. Um, the panel is going to investigate long-term changes in insect biodiversity and biomass. And it's part of a larger um, conference whose, whose theme is re resilience. Um, so I wanna kick off the panel by talking a little bit about insects, uh, biodiversity, biomass, and resilience. Uh, towards this end, um, I've divided my comments uh, into four parts. First, I wanna show you some wicked cool insects. Second, I wanna talk about how many kinds of insects there are on earth, that is insect biodiversity. Third, I wanna talk about total biomass of insects on earth, that is um, uh, the, the weight of all those insects. And fourth, I want to end with one perspective on insect conservation. This is a tiger beetle. Um, and I put it up as my first slide because I always smile just a little when I kick up one of these tiger beetles while I'm walking along a dirt road. This is an ichnomotid wasp. Um, uh, it has a long uh, ovipositor or stinger in vernacular parlance, which it uses to reach beetle larvae buried in rotten logs. These rhinoceros beetles are using their horns to fight over a female. And these uh, dung beetles uh, are provisioning resources for their young. They're an indicator species uh, for healthy prairies. Leafcutter ants um, harvest leaves and then grow fungus on them. And then they harvest the fungus and feed it to their young. And some uh, insects are just from an alien other world. Um, uh, this slide is not what you think it is. And I might add that this slide is going to separate the JDs in the audience from the PhDs. The JDs are going to recoil in disgust and the PhDs are going to think this is way cool. The yellow, is, the yellow and black is the abdomen um, of a wasp. The, the winged creature you see is a male Strepsistra, which is very roughly as closely related to wasps as a mouse is related to a man. The male strepsistra is mating with an adult female strepsistra, which is a caterpillar-like creature without wings, not visible in the slide. The female strepsistra uh, uh, lives its entire life in the abdomen of its wasp host. Just about as weird as you can get, I believe. And this is a camouflage loper. Uh, it is a caterpillar um, of a moth. It's there, but you cannot see it. And as such, I think this slide is a good transition to a discussion of, of insect biodiversity. Just like this camouflage loper, there are lots and lots of insect species that scientists are sure exist, but they've not been, quote, seen by science. Likely there are five species hidden and never seen by scientists for every one species of insect known to science. Moving on to a discussion of biological diversity. Biodiversity is a bit of a jargon term, so I thought it'd be useful just to take some time and break it apart. Bio means biological or having to do with life, and diversity means number of different kinds. Mm -hmm. so, so, so insect biodiversity, 
then means number of different kinds um, of insects. There are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of insects. This plate shows a, a little bit, just a little bit of the, of the beetle biodiversity. The population geneticist JBS Haldane has said, God had an inordinate fondness for beetles, and he was quite correct. The fly biologist Art Borkins has said, it is difficult to relate to non-specialists just how vast our igno ignorance of insect biodiversity truly is. And he was also quite correct. Just how vast is our ignorance of insect biodiversity? Well, we do not know if on planet Earth there are more species of beetles, of wasps, or of flies. More beetles have been described in the scientific literature, but I think a good case can be made that there are actually more wasps and bees than there are beetles. Um, one recent estimate is that there are roughly three to nine uh, wasp parasites on every beetle species. And a decent case can be made um, that there are actually more flies uh, than wasps. So how many kinds of insect species are there? Well, we know essentially all bird species. There are about 10,000 bird uh, species on planet Earth. And essentially all of them have been seen and studied by scientists. I've deliberately obscured the numbers on this slide pertaining to insect species, making them blurred and illegible. The scientific literature is is confused as to how many insect species <laughs> there are in the world. So I'm confused. So I thought that it would be only fair that, the audi that my audience also be confused. This slide presents the real face of scientific uncertainty. It seems that my entire life as a scientist is that there are things that I want to know that I simply cannot know um, because of impediments to knowledge. Very roughly, there are one million species of insects described in the scientific literature. Uh, perhaps five to 10 million species exist on planet Earth. The number could easily be uh, higher than five to 10 million it's very unlikely that it's lower. So just to give you some perspective on what say five to 10 million species of insects means, um, there are 50,000, roughly 50,000 tops uh, baseball cards in existence. And these are distinct cards. And there's some 170 million items um, in the Library of Congress. This analogy between um, insects, baseball cards, and books actually goes deeper than um, what's presented in this slide. And I'll come back to that in my concluding comments on insect conservation. Well, there's, in my view, compelling um, uh, anecdotal information for an ongoing um, insect uh, apocalypse. Raoul later on is going to prevent, present you with scientific uh, data, but I actually think that the, um, uh, that the anecdotal information is, is just as compelling as the science. Um, this is from an anonymous uh, long haul trucker. It used to be when I was driving through the southern part of the Midwest, like I am right now, I'd, stop, I'd have to stop every few hours to clean the bugs off my windshield. It's been three days since I've had to clean the bugs off my windshield on this trip. There's something spooky going on out there. And this has been, uh, his observations have been repeated uh, by lots and lots of people um, over broad uh, geographic areas. So moving on to the third part of my talk um, on insect biomass. Um, what is the weight of all insects on planet Earth? 
Each insect um, weighs a relatively insignificant amount. Think about, for example, the weight of a mosquito. Yet taken together, there are roughly 500 pounds of insects uh, for each person on Earth. Yet um, it's also true that the weight of, of all people and the weight of all insects is quite small um, in comparison to the weights of, of other living things like uh, plants um, and uh, bacteria and uh, marine um, animals. So looking at this uh, slide, you might think that human impacts on the environment are relatively small. This slide um, presents a somewhat different and I think much more accurate picture. In fact, human impacts on the natural world are immense, um, even though the weight of humans and the weight of insects is small. Um, even uh, if we could look at um, human-made structures, that is things made out of concrete, out of metal, building, um, asphalt, roadways, all the things that, that go to make up uh, the physical structure of human uh, uh, civilization. Um, critically, um, at this uh, year, in the year 2021, all those human structures weigh as much as all living things on earth combined. I think that's an absolutely stunning statistic and you pretty much don't have to go any further um, to understand the immense uh, human impacts on the natural environment. And these um, impacts are up dramatically since 1900 where those human structures um, were large but nowhere near um, what they are today. So, um, Coming, uh, circling back to the conference theme of resilience, um, I think there's uh, really compelling evidence um, that humans are having an immense um, impact on the structure and function of natural ecosystems. Uh, four points um, taken from the recent scientific literature. Um, first, as shown in the previous slide, the weight of all human structures on Earth is now equal to the weight of all living things on Earth, um, and that's only happened within the last century. A second, as shown on the previous slide, uh, the weight of human structures on Earth is up 30-fold um, since 1900. Um, third point, um, is that the weight of all humans combined is now 20 fold more than the weight of all uh, land mammals combined. Um, and that, by the way, is just humans. If you were to include cattle and other domestic animals, um, you know, in sort of a generalized human total, the numbers would be even more stunning. And uh, fourth, um, human energy consumption is now tenfold greater um, than it was in 1900. So with, with numbers like this, um, I think there can just be no debate at all about the immense um, impact of humans on uh, natural ecosystems. So with that, I want to turn to the fourth and final part of my talk on uh, insect um, conservation. And to do that, I have to develop um, this analogy between baseball cards, books, and insects in a little uh, more detail. Um, this analogy is much more than superficial. The reason I want to do this is that the words of loss of biodiversity um, to me are, are deceptive. And the reason is that, that when you say loss of biodiversity, it doesn't um, evoke any emotion. Uh, for me, saying that we are burning the insect library is a much more accurate description um, of what I, I think is, is going on. And to that, I, I, uh, to develop that point, I have to go into this analogy a little bit more. So um, about the analogy between insects, baseball cards, and books, well, some books are quite common, um, others are rare. Uh, so too with baseball cards um, and so too um, with um, insects. Um, there are multiple copies of each book 
And so too, there are multiple copies of each distinct baseball card. Um, and there are multiple copies of each insect. Um, we can copy a baseball card um, or a book on a photocopy machine and insects get copied um, uh, during the process of sexual reproduction. So um, all these similarities between insects, baseball cards, and books. Um, also some key differences. Um, we can easily count baseball cards um, and books. Uh, we cannot easily count um, insects. We know that there's no vault of hidden books um, in the Library of Congress. Um, by contrast, I think there's good evidence that there's a vault of hidden insect species in the tropical rainforest that um, contains perhaps five to 10 times the number of insect species that have been described um, in uh, the scientific literature, which is effectively a card catalog uh, for, um, uh, for science. There are also uh, significant differences in how, um, uh, in, in the process that creates all this diversity. Uh, baseball card diversity is created by economic forces. Books are created by human intellectual effort. And all this insect biodiversity that we're talking about is created by the process of evolution by natural selection. So to conclude my comments, um, what we're doing here is burning the insect library. Scientists uh, measure information using uh, units of bits. There are about 128 uh, gigabits of information on your cell phone, and that um, is equal to about um, a trillion um, bits. Um, and, and critically, at a fundamental level, the DNA in all of these insect species that we're talking about is just information written um, in the DNA language. Um, and it's entirely analogous to um, the English language. And so what we can do is look at the bits of information in all of these insect species that we're losing. And then we can compare it to the bits of information in the Library of Congress. And when I did this calculation, I was rather stunned to see that within an order of magnitude, the bits of information in insect species is equal to the bits of information in the Library of Congress. So if you want one perspective on what's going on, we are, we are burning a cultural resource that, in my view, is equivalent to the Library of Congress. And I would end my talk just with the rhetorical question, what would we give now to have back all of the documents that were formerly present um, in the Mayan, uh, Greek, and Egyptian libraries um, and that are now lost and, and gone uh, forever? So with that, um, I'd uh, like to ask for questions. And if there's no questions, uh, turn it over to Ro. You can go ahead, Ro. Unmute myself. That's step one. Step two is share screen. Do it. Yep. Do you see that? Excellent. All right. So thanks, Greg. That was a great introduction. So now let's have a look at how the insects are doing. Now, we've known for a while that insects in many places are not doing particularly well. And here you see some examples from the scientific literature already in 2004. Uh, there was a paper that showed that the, the, the butterflies in the UK, most species were declining. And you can see that 
basically in these red bars are all the declining species and this is the percentage of species. Then there was another review 2014 that also put together some, uh, some trend data from insects and that also showed strong declines. There have been papers that show species richness decline. So this means the number of species of insects that occur at a single location over time. So you see just fewer uh, kinds of insects at, at these particular locations. And there have also been some papers that show that in some other locations, in this case in Germany, the sheer number of insects has been declining. But it was not until this paper in 2017 that this, um, that this issue caught the attention of the media. And this was a paper from some nature reserves here in Western Germany that, uh, am, I, am I correct that you do not see my pointer or do you see my pointer moving? Oh, you see it, that's great. Um, so they showed that the biomass of insects, so that's the whole lot of insects, the weight of the insects combined has been declining steeply since the early 90s. And this caught the attention a lot and there was a lot of media uh, uh, attention with uh, Armageddon, uh, Apocalypse, and if you would believe the media and these case studies that I just showed you, this is a clear deal a done deal in fact, and the insects are going to hell rapidly and we are going to follow them. And we have, I've been working on insect um, time series for quite a while already. And we had, I mean, we've seen some of these things, but not at this scale. So for us, it was like, no, we need to look deeper into this. And some other scientists have also done this. Um, so here's another way of looking at um, how the insects are doing. And this is a paper from the UK from last year. They looked at occupancy and you can, can understand this at the number of locations where each species of insect is occurring. And they did that for uh, different groups of organisms, not only for insects. So you can see freshwater organisms that would be also some insects would also be uh, little crustaceans. It would be uh, snails in the water, etc. Uh, and they also looked at bryophytes, the, those are mosses and lichens. And you see already vastly different trends for the UK. You see the insects of, on average, so these are 3000 species for the insects, they look to be increasing in occupancy. So the number of places where they occur. Um, the other invertebrates seem stable. The the mosses and lichens are steeply increasing, which is actually logical because the air quality in the UK has improved tremendously over this time period. Um, and the freshwater organisms have first been going down and then have made a steep recovery. And this is also not surprising because this is exactly the timing when all the wastewater treatment plants have been installed, not just in the UK, but all over the Western world. And the further you zoom in, the more the complex the picture gets. So here they make a comparison between species that are widespread and common in red and the rare species in blue. And you see already some differences uh, developing. And the further you go down in the different groups, the more complex the picture gets. So here they compare within uh, groups of organisms. So for here, for example, the beetles, they have different families of beetles. Uh, like ladybirds, you know, uh, weevils, you may know, and, and most, some of them show completely different trends than the other. And so there are very, very different trends starting to develop here, the further you deep, dig in. And this picture is becoming more and more clear that it is not as simple as many people think. And here's another paper that actually came out yesterday in the, in the journal Science, and they looked at butterflies in the Western US, three different data sets and many different species. And they looked at how are these species doing? And there you see what fascinates me is that all these different data sets that are collected in uh, vastly different ways, all show the same kind of pattern 
that the majority of the species are declining, but you can also see that there's still some species that are actually increasing. So here to the right of the zero, those are the increasing species and to the left are the declining species. What's even more interesting is that along the coast, almost all the species are doing bad, but at some places, especially here in the mountains, so here's Colorado, lots of species are actually increasing. And then they try to analyze what is causing this. And to them, it seems that the, um, the bigger the difference between the warming in summer and fall, the, the more likely it is that the butterflies are declining. So if it gets warmer in fall, you're gonna have more declines for butterflies. And that is probably what is especially happening here along the coast. So again, a, a very complex picture. And now we're gonna to get to my own work where we were interested in the total number of insects. And you can um, imagine that this is not done very often and we had to take very variable data sources, but basically we took everything where people have been measuring the number of insects for over 10 years. And first we see where does the data come from and how long have they been measuring? And you will not be surprised that the vast majority of the data that we found are from Europe, especially Western Europe, uh, but also some in Eastern Europe and quite some from Russia and the US. All not surprising. What is fascinating though, is that the longest time series, so the, the where they started the earliest are from somewhere in Russia and Kazakhstan, where they started catching insects and measuring the biomass in 1925. Um, so you see also that in Western Asia, in Eastern Asia, there's more and more of these data becoming available. So we, of course, wanted to look how are the insects doing at all of these different places. And what you then see when you do that is that it's the same mess. So for the terrestrial insects, that's the ones that are living on land, you see that it's a bit of a mess, but overall you see quite some red dots, which means that the insects are going down at these places. If you look at the freshwater insects, so those would be species like dragonflies, but also mosquitoes and midges, all that kind of stuff, you see that they, the, the map looks a little bit different and there's a bit more blue, so that means that there could be more um, increasing species or more locations where the, where the insects are increasing. And that is indeed what you find when you put all of this together into a model. And this, this is a similar graph. You see here the mean estimate of all the locations. Uh, and if it's to the right of this, of the zero, then, the, then they're increasing. If it's to the left, they're, decli they're, left to the, they're declining. And you see here the terrestrial are indeed declining and the freshwater are increasing. You see here the amount of data that is underlying each of these estimates. And we see that these, this pattern is fairly consistent over the world. It's just that the more data we have, the, um, the clearer the pattern. So we see, of course, most, most data comes from Europe and North America, and it shows the same trend and the same for the, the, the decline for the terrestrial insects. If we zoom in a little bit more, we see again more variation. And what is interesting here is that the declines are steepest in Germany, the American West and the American Midwest. And what is even more interesting is that also for the freshwater insects, we do see a decline in the US Midwest, whereas the only real significant increases, so the further you are from this line and the, the smaller this, this, what we call a credible interval is, um, the more certain we are that there is actually an increase. And this is what we see in Northern Europe, and that is probably caused by climate change. And we see it in the, in the Western US, also these increases. Now, of course, we're not only interested in what the total number of insects, so the number of individuals are doing, we also wanna know what the, um, what the number of species is doing at the same locations. And that is what we're working on now. And hopefully that's gonna be published this year still. And if we 
make a relationship between the change in the number of individuals. So again, to the right of the zero, those are increases, to the left are declines. And here you see also declines. So in this quadrant, you see declines in richness and in abundance. And in this quadrant, you see increases in both metrics. You see that, especially for the blue ones that are dragging this whole line, if you have a steep increase you will of abundance, you will probably also have a steep increase in the number of species. And for declines, that goes the same. But you can also see that there's quite some, in the middle, the predictability is very poor. So if there's a small change in either richness or abundance, you can actually not be very sure what the other metric is going to be doing. So this is stuff we're working on right now. Of course, we also want to know what is causing these changes. And our first hypothesis was, well, is there a difference between areas that are protected and areas that are not protected? And we tested this and there you do in indeed see that the decline for the terrestrial insects inside protected areas is less steep than outside protected areas, but also for the freshwater, the increase uh, inside the protected areas is less steep than the increase outside the protected areas, which would agree with our hypothesis that this is at least to some extent caused by water quality improvement. And of course, in a protected area, you don't generally need water quality improvement. Then we put some maps under that. We got global layers of the change in urban uh, area in all of our locations. And here you see actually not very surprising that the more urban cover you get in, in your region uh, where you've been collecting insects, the, the, the more the steeper the insects are going down. And we had hypothesized to find something similar with agriculture, but we didn't. And in fact, in areas where there is already lots of or agriculture, we see that the trends, at least for terrestrial insects, are more stable. So they are declining less when there is a lot of agriculture. And they are declining here more. And that might just be because uh, the areas where there's little crop cover, there's probably a lot of city. So these were our uh, results that were somewhat surprising and in some ways we could explain them very well. And the reason why the, the story is so confusing is that there are so many different reasons why insects might be declining. It can go from uh, climate change, invasive species, uh, pollution, uh, to just habitat destruction. And all of these um, different drivers will have different effects on different kinds of insects. And therefore, it, it makes it an extremely difficult question and extremely difficult to find solutions, especially considering that we have, as you just heard, more than 1 million species of insects and uh, several million that we don't even know. So I will conclude with a few take home messages. Um, yes, many, many insect species are declining and there are many, many causes for this. But if you will, if you uh, improve the conditions at the location where the insects are living, they can recover quite rapidly. And we know almost nothing about most of the insect species on earth. And with that, I need to acknowledge our funding and uh, all the people who made uh, data available to us. And I want to thank you for your attention and I will take questions now. Um, we've got a question for you, Raul. Um... So Raul, when you looked at agriculture, did you uh, differentiate between types of ag operations and crop cover? I imagine heavily sprayed monocultures would be different from more diverse and holistically managed operations. That is an excellent question. So at the scale that we're working on of the whole world, there is just a data limitation. So we don't actually know what exactly is happening on all of these places. And we have to take the lowest uh, common denominator that we could find. And this is basically 
is this a crop field or is it not a crop field? So no, we do not have any idea of what is actually happening in these locations. And the second thing here is that most of the data we have are from the last 30 years. And in the last 30 years, there has, in at least in Europe, and I believe also in the US, not been a whole lot of change in the size of agricultural area and the amount of spraying that's been done. So over the last 30 years, I would not necessarily expect to see a change because it was not very good 30 years ago, and it's still not very good. And then another one for you. Um, have you got information on the impact of GMO agriculture versus non-GMO? No. Uh, the other problem that we face is that um, these areas, these heavily agricultural areas, but also very highly urbanized areas are rarely measured, especially historically. Uh, we also almost have no information from areas that have been converted. So we have nothing from a, trop from a pristine tropical rainforest that is then being cut down and turned into a, a let's say, a, a crop field or a, a beef farm. And so this is what we call the parking lot effect. Once something like this happens, we don't have any data anymore from areas like this. So we yeah, have absolutely underrepresented in all in all kinds of ways. If I could expand just a bit on uh, Raul's comments on that. Um, there, uh, there, there is a certain amount of data from uh, limited sites that are being farmed in a somewhat more sustainable manner than monocultures. So I've, I know, for example, on uh, Joel Salatin's uh, uh, polyphyus farm in Virginia, um, there have been studies done on um, bumblebee diversity on that particular site, um, you know, showing that they've got a, a very significant fraction of the total bumblebee diversity in the entire state present there. So, you know, this is one of the problems we've got is, is that when you try to aggregate like Raul has, has, you know, really made the effort to do and, and got some, you know, amazing results. Um, you often can't do it because you don't have enough data sets, but, but there are these data sets out there, which I think are pointing to um, pr pretty dramatic positive impacts of these sustainable farming practices. All right, that's all we have for now. I think we can move on. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Then we, I will turn over to Tara and Christine, who will tell us about the solutions to the problems, I hope. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. That was um, immensely interesting. I'm going to share my screen, and Tara and I are going to... Um, Tara, it's not letting me do it. Would you mind uh, sharing it? I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Gonna, uh, it never works for me when I have my external monitor, so I'm going to plug this. Ugh. That will work. Oh, wait. Looks like it might work now. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Sorry. All right. Um, okay, great. Uh, so I think I will kick us off here. So um, excellent. Well, thank you, Roel and Craig, for laying out those um, bigger picture issues. Uh, so um, Christine and I, as Ankara mentioned in the beginning, work at the Center for Biological Diversity. 
I'm a scientist there and Christina is an attorney. And we focus mostly on using the Endangered Species Act to conserve species and also insects. Uh, so we're going to kind of focus on that today, also because this is the law conference. Um, it's a you know it's a great tool legally for us to use for conserving species in at least in the United States. Um, so here's kind of our contact information. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, and my Twitter handle there in case you're interested. All right. So this is kind of what our roadmap is um, for what we're going to talk about today. Basically, why the ESA? Why is the Endangered Species Act a useful tool to combat, um, or, or a part of the toolbox, I guess you could say, to combat insect declines um, to begin to do that? And then how the ESA works, how exactly the petitioning process works and the legal process works, Christine will cover most of that. And then um, I'll jump back in with some specific examples of insect species that um, I've petitioned for thus far and kind of, or, or others have petitioned for as well, and kind of where those are at and, and how that's going and um, how, you know, you've, you've heard from Craig and, and Roel that we are, you know, definitely lacking in data <laughs> in many instances from threats, you know, to agriculture to also specific ranges and information about species. So I'll mention that as well. And, and you'll see in the examples, some of the best ones that we have basically. And then finally, um, we'll kind of jump back to Christ Christine to talk a little bit more about some roadblocks to listing species under the ESA, particularly um, an issue, a specific issue under there. And I will provide some examples of where, if that was not the case, it could be helpful to protect insects. Great. So just to kind of give an overview of how the Endangered Species Act fits in with uh, general insect conservation, um, this is a figure from um, a paper called International Scientists Formulate a Roadmap for Insect Conservation and Recovery. Um, and I was uh, lucky to be a part of this um, paper. And in this figure, you can kind of see here, we created these what we called no regret solutions. So as Roel mentioned, you know, the, the story is nuanced. And so some people have said, well, you know, we need more information before we can do something. But really clearly we've seen, you know, declines um, as Craig and, and Roel mentioned, where we, need, we know we need to do something, you know, to reverse this loss of biodiversity. And in this sort of wheel here, there are many different types of solutions that we considered, you know, no regret, basically like we can start them now, we should be doing them now um, to try to increase insect biodiversity and prevent the losses. Um, you know, from in increasing landscape heterogeneity, which means basically making lots of different habitats <laughs> in agriculture, reducing pollution, as we saw is important for freshwater diversity of insects, um, education and awareness, such as doing, you know, panels like this, um, restoration. And then Christine, if you could click one more time, I have a couple animations on this slide. Um, there we go. And then this one is the one sort of where the Endangered Species Act intersects with uh, the insect conservation. So specifically focusing on some threatened, specific threatened species and how we can conserve those. Um, hopefully those kind of become umbrella species, meaning that they will protect other species as well. And then also, um, there we go, yeah, it's the other component of this is to prioritize data gathering and assessment of insects. As we mentioned, you know, there were just lack of data and lack of information and we just need more. And so, but however, we can still, you know, do conservation actions. Um, but the petitioning process, you know, requires, as you'll see in a moment, to collect a lot of information about species. And so it also helps us with this prioritization of doing assessments. All right. Yeah, and so really the best tool we have that combines conservation with policy and science is the Endangered Species Act. And really looking at the Endangered Species Act now, we really have to consider it as a gift from Congress. I mean, there is no way that such an expansive and powerful and useful act would ever be enacted in our political landscape now. And what's interesting in terms of invertebrates and, and insects is that when um, 
during the hearings when they were enacting the ESA, they, um, the Congress people considered providing even more protections to plants and invertebrate species because, as they said, they form the basis of all ecosystems and food chains, food chains upon which other life depends. And so, you know, while the ESA doesn't provide those extra or special protections to insects and invertebrates, it does specifically include language in, um, in the act that um, protects insects and other invertebrates. Um, and most importantly is that decisions made for species under the act must be based on best available scientific information. Um, so why do we want species listed? What are the effects of getting an insect listed under the act? Well, one of them is the recovery plan. So once a species is listed, the service may, um, should, come up with a recovery plan, which must contain objective measurable criteria based on best available science that when implemented will result in the recovery or the delisting of species. Another benefit is section seven consultation, which means that when there is a federal agency action, that federal agency has to consult with the expert agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fishery Service to determine whether that action um, jeopardizes the continued existence of that species or adversely modifies critical habitat of this, that species or results in a take of that species. And um, take right now, that brings us to section nine, is so section nine prohibits take of listed species. And this is an interesting area right now for a couple of reasons. Um, well, so first, take protections aren't equal for endangered versus threatened species. So under the act, an endangered species is protected from all take. So all take, whether purposeful or incidental. And when I say take, just for all the non-legal people out there, that is defined as harassing, harming, killing, hunting, shooting, wounding, or trapping, really anything that hurts the species. So endangered species are protected against all types of take, incidental or purposeful. But the Act's language doesn't specifically provide for protections of inc against incidental take for threatened species. It says, and this is section four, that unless the service can specifically provide for incidental take for threatened species, um, for a specific species. But when they were enacting the ESA, the service recognized that, you know, maybe threatened and endangered species should both be protected against incidental take. And so what they did was enacted what we call a blanket 4D rule. So that meant that regardless of whether the species was threatened or endangered, incidental take was prohibited. Um, and so that was great for a long time. But then in 2019, the Trump administration decided to just completely remove this blanket 4D rule, which meant that any species listed as threatened from that time on wasn't automatically protected against incidental take and was only protected against incidental take if the service, you know, enacted that a, a species specific incidental take prohibition. Um, so what we can expect to see and what we're already seeing now is um, the service listing species as threatened when maybe really they should be endangered, more of that. And um, what we are seeing now is that these 4D rules that they are enacting for the threatened species um, often miss the mark or completely, you know, disregard the threat of incidental take um, to the species. And one example that we've seen is the American bearing beetle. So um, this beetle 
is extremely interesting. Uh, and I'm going to try to describe the characteristics of this um, beetle, but my co-panelists will probably be better at it. So if you guys have any, um, anything you want to add while I'm describing this, please do so. So the American varying beetle is mostly found in the Midwest and one with one population in the in New England. And it's mostly lives in grasslands and pra prairies. And it's interesting because it finds its mate and then together they find carrion or a dead animal and uh, usually like a, a squirrel or a, a small bird and so they find this dead animal and then they bury it together and then they wrap the beetles wrap it in its secretions and then they lay their eggs in it and um this beetle is very interesting for obviously a lot of reasons, but also because I think it's one of the only insect species or beetle species that will rear its young. So it takes care, it lays its eggs and it takes care of its larva um, until they become baby beetles and can sustain themselves. So super interesting beetle that was, it was listed by the service as endangered in 1989, and it was also one of the first insects to be listed under the act. Um, at the time it, it was listed, you know, there were only, there were very few species or very few populations. Since listing, there's been a ton more research, um, and this research has found that, you know, there are lots of threats to the species primarily, and it's primarily habitat fragmentation and habitat destruction from agriculture, urban development, and energy development. Um, and, and most recently, they've discovered that climate change is um, the most prominent uh, threat going on right now. So again, since listing, the service has said, you know, research has said, the threats are increasing, there are more threats, um, but in 2019, the petroleum industry petitioned to downlist the species from endangered to threatened. Um, and that's because the beetle population in the southern, in its southern range is on, uh, prime oil and gas development land. Um, and so unsurprisingly, the Trump administration did reclassify the American bearing beetle as threatened and the 4D rule that they provided completely just you know misses the mark they there's no protection to the beetles um, or habitat destruction in the one area that oil and gas development will almost certainly occur um, so another aspect that another part of um, some sketchy business that the service is doing in terms of insects and other species, including the American bearing beetle, is that they're really stretching the definition of threatened. And so an endangered, endangered is defined as a species that's in danger of extinction throughout all or significant portion of its range. Threatened is defined as a species that's likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. And so threatened then means a species is likely to become in danger of extinction in the foreseeable future. So for the bearing beetle, the service determined that as early as 19 years, within the next 19 years, the southern portion, a significant portion of the beetle's range, the southern analysis area, will be extinct due to climate change. But they reasoned that because 19 years is the foreseeable future, it therefore is threatened. And so the question really is, if, if extinction in 19 years isn't in danger of extinction and thus endangered, then really what is? You know, is it next year? Is it next month? And so the center is planning on challenging um, the Trump administration's downlisting of the species. We sent a notice of intent to sue and are expecting to file a complaint um, soon. Um, yeah, so now that we know what 
what the benefits are and some issues we're facing once the species is listed. Tara's going to explain the process of actually getting a species listed under the Act. You're muted, Tara. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, great, thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, so typically, um, so the Act was meant so that um, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fishery Service could uh, list species uh, without necessarily having the petitions. They could do them themselves when they knew that there were uh, species that were endangered or threatened. Um, however, kind of over the over recent-ish years, the vast, vast majority of species that get listed are because of petitions. And petitions come from scientists, from private people, from NGOs like us. Um, and so that's kind of what's the sort of the norm now. Um, the issue is, is that petitions require a lot of work and a lot of information. Uh, and particularly, they require historic and current date range data and or population trends. Uh, both is better. <laughs> um, but you definitely need to show that there was a significant reduction in range um, and, and or a significant reduction in population which is very difficult for insect species. We don't have a lot of that information. Um, and so it, it's already kind of a high bar to reach. In addition to that, it requires the connection of specific threats to specific species. So you can't just say, you know, that climate change is impacting this bumblebee. You have to actually sort of show that we're in the bumblebee's range. There has already been changes such as drought in the California, um, you know, in the Western US, which is pretty easy to show, especially in, in you know, the last decade or so, um, and connect it directly to that species range, as well as pesticide use in that, in that area where the species is, or grazing or invasive species. So it really needs to be specific. Um, in particular, if you go to the next slide, there are five categories of threats that you need to touch on in the petition process. Um, so the first one is kind of an overarching sort of habitat loss, modification or curtailment of habitat or range. So that one is a little bit, um, can be easier. Sometimes it's a little vague, so you, like urbanization obviously is an impact, but how do you prove that urbanization is a threat to a certain species? It's not easy. Um, Overutilization is one that sometimes actually does impact insects, particularly pretty tiger beetles or butterflies that people like to collect. So that could potentially also be an issue. Uh, disease or predation, um, that one tends to be more of an issue when a certain disease is created by um, human actions, such as um, honeybees uh, carrying diseases to native bees. Um, inadequacy of ex existing regulatory mechanisms. So basically what that means is that you need to show that there isn't a current law or regulation that protects that species particularly. Um, so sometimes if the species would be listed under a state endangered species act, that could potentially be a regulatory mechanism. Although in the United States, uh, California really is the only state that has a kind of an endangered species act that's equivalent to the federal one. Um, and then finally, any other factors that contribute to their decline. Uh, and this is sort of where climate change or invasive species impacts that don't fit in the habitat threat um, will tend to go. Um, and, and again, it's, it's difficult to, to connect these specific threats to insect species. All right, so head, head, give it back to Christine to talk about sort of what happens after you do submit a petition, and then I'll, I'll give you guys some examples. Yeah, so the, the ESA provides strict deadlines that the service has to meet when they're reviewing or when they receive a petition from anyone. Um, so the first deadline is the 90 day deadline, which is just the service making a determination regarding whether the listing petition presents scientific information that indicates that the petition that listing the species may be warranted. And then the second deadline is the 12 month finding, which has to be done 12 months again from the receipt of the petition. And that is a determination regarding whether listing may be warranted or warranted but precluded or not warranted. And this is a nice little graphic from the Fish and Wildlife Services site. Um, 
after the service, if the deserve, if the service determines that listing is warranted, then they propose a public, uh, then they publish a proposed rule that people can comment on, and then they uh, announce and publish the final rule. Um, and so the language of the ESA regarding these deadlines is unambiguous and very, you know, it's strict. Um, but regardless of that, the service often will fail to meet those deadlines. And when we're talking about failure to meet these deadlines, we're talking like failure in the order of hundreds and hundreds of species. Um, and so, you know, the we're really left with one choice and that's to file these deadline suits because otherwise, you know, these species that some of them are quite literally on the verge of extinction are just waiting forever for the service to make a determination. And so we file these deadline suits and it holds the services feet to the fire. And the goal of them really is just for the service to come up with what we call a work plan. And that is, that is where the service lists all the species, where we list all the species uh, that are awaiting 12 month findings or determinations. And um, then the service, you know, comes up with a deadline, an approximate deadline for when they will make that determination for that specific species. Um, so for example, the, the center initiated a deadline suit, um, which resulted in a 2016 work plan. And that suit uh, involved over 550 species, a lot of them insects. Um, and so the 2016 work plan was a result. Unfortunately, the service has um, not complied with <laughs> some of those deadlines. And so litigation is a, another option there. Uh, this year we filed, um, we've worked on a lot of deadline suits as well. And Tara has, uh, has some interesting um, insects that were involved in that suit. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, right, so, you know, on average, I think it's it takes about 12 years from petition to get a species listed, uh, which is, is quite a long time. So doing these deadline suits, we can try to advance a little bit and, and have some kind of creation of a triage, right? Um, and so here's an example of a petition of a uh, native bee. This is a Mojave poppy bee, and it's on its it's special it's specialized on on bear poppies. And here it is on the Las Vegas bear poppy. Um, this is one of the species that we had you know enough information. There's been some recent science on it, some recent work, to actually warrant a petition. And right now it's only found in about seven locations in Las Vegas and where those yellow triangles are. It's gone from sort of the less, the rest of Nevada, um, which, you know, is for those of you not familiar with that, it's like kind of like right in this part. Um, there's been some recent surveys in Utah and you can't quite see this whole map, but um, basically we're pretty sure it's extinct in Utah, which is unfortunate because it actually was a specialist pollinator on another endangered plant there, the, the bear claw poppy. And then in California, recent um, general bee surveys have not found it. So it's, it's not doing well. It's only really found sort of in this um, BLM area, um, the National Park Service area up here along Lake Mead. Uh, it's threatened by urbanization. It's close to Las Vegas, right? So <laughs> urbanization is a big issue. It's also threatened by gypsum mining, off-road vehicles, and um, some grazing as well. And so this one is on our deadline suit to, to get the Fish and Wildlife Service to act on. And um, you can go to the next one. Thanks. Another native bee is the Gulf Coast Solitary Bee. It's specialized on this plant, the um, uh, honeycomb head, it's called, this plant. And it is found in the Gulf Coast, really close to the shoreline. So you can imagine it's extremely threatened by climate change. Um, so this is another issue with the foreseeable future. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has put this one kind of lower on the totem pole in terms of its uh, threatened issues, um, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of development also that happens in its beachfront habitat. So um, this is also part of our deadline suit. Okay, uh, switching from bees, we have a beetle. The um, Bethany Beach Firefly is also part of our deadline suit. This is one of the most rare fireflies that we know of, at least in the United States. It's specialist on freshwater swales in Delaware, 
you can kind of see so a few places that it's actually been sort of found. Um, luckily, it's it's kind of in a couple state parks. However, wherever it's found, its abundances are very low, you know, from like a very few individuals. Um, unfortunately, one of its biggest abundance areas is being developed um, into housing. So we kind of filed this emergency petition to try to get some mitigation for that. However, um, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service haven't acted on this yet. And so again, we're including this one in our deadline suit. And then finally, um, a petition that I actually did not write because uh, it was petitioned for back in 2010, I believe. So this one has been 11 years and this is the Franklin's bumblebee. And the Franklin's bumblebee actually could potentially be extinct now. It hasn't been seen um, in a few years, even though Fish and Wildlife Service and other uh, agencies and scientists, um, including myself, I got to go out and look for it as well in the mountains of Southern Oregon, um, haven't seen it in several years. So um, this is kind of a consequence, you know, of, of waiting for protection. All right. And it back over to Yeah, so the last concept or issue we wanted to talk about was this, um, the issue of a distinct population segment. And so when Congress was, um, one of the main motivations that Congress had when enacting the ESA was actually to protect genetic di diversity. And I wanted to share this quote from a chairman discussing the ESA. They said, from the most narrow possible point of view, it is in the best interest of mankind to minimize losses of genetic variation. The reason is simple, they are potential resources. They are keys to puzzles which we cannot yet solve and may provide answers to questions which we have not yet learned to ask. Um, I just think that's incredible <laughs> that a Congress person, you know, said that and wouldn't it be amazing if all of our Congress people thought the same now. Um, but luckily they did at the time of enacting the ESA, which meant that distinct population segment is included in the definition of species. And that's because for, for example, there may be an apparently abundant, an apparently abundant species that masks or contains a genetic variation, a population of genetic variation of that species that may be threatened or endangered. Or on the other hand, there may be a threatened species that contains a population that's more abundant or that has um, greater threats that maybe warrants endangered status qualifying for a different protection. And so that distinct population segment portion of species, um, the definition of species, really allows us to use the ESA as a more precise tool. So the one bummer about or unfortunate situation about this distinct population segment is that it only applies to vertebrate species. Um, and while I was looking through the legislative history of the ESA, it was very evident that the definition of species was a very contentious and heated subject. And it seems that by uh, limiting distinct population segments to vertebrate species, um, it was, you know, a compromise. And um, it was an unfortunate compromise as Tara is going to explain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll give you guys a couple examples of how this issue with distinct population segment um, is preventing maybe some protection of, of insects where it could be more clear. Um, so the American bumblebee it was a very widespread species. As you can see, all those dots, that's where it used to be found. It's very difficult on this map to see sort of the green versus the gray. Um, but the gray is where it's currently found and the green is where it's used to be. But um, my colleague at the center petitioned to list the American bumblebee. And what he did was to create kind of, he colored the state so you can see where it's green and yellow, that's where there's less worry, where it's declined less that we know of. And where it's orange and red, it's it's more, it's much more steep decline. Um, so there's a, been a 50% kind of overall decline according to the IUCN of the species. Most of it has been east of the Rocky Mountains in the Northeast and the Midwest. Uh, so where most of those orange and red states are. 
Um, the issue with this species is that there is a another a, a subspecies or potentially another species, depending on who you ask, called um, the Sonoran bumblebee. Um, the Sonoran bumblebee is actually right now considered the same species, so it's lumped in with the American bumblebee. It could be a subspecies, but you know more genetic information is needed. It's been found to hybridize, so that's probably indicative that it's at least you know, subspecies probably the same. So taking both of these together, you know, we have the Sonoran bumblebee. And if you look at the inset map from the Google Maps, that's where the Sonoran portion of the American bumblebee lives. Clearly it overlaps with more of the green and yellow states. So it's where the bumblebee is doing better. So in this case, if we were able to petition to list a distinct population segment of insects, we would clearly focus on the more Northeast Midwest population of this insect that's considered the American bumblebee as opposed to the Sonoran bumblebee. So this is one example of where we could have used that law if it was available to insects. And another one is one that everyone kind of, most people at least are beloved, the monarchs. Um, so you may have heard that the monarchs, uh, we listed to petition the monarchs, or petition to list the monarchs in 2014. So we're at seven years now. Um, in December of last year, the service decided that the petition was warranted so that the butterfly should be listed, but precluded, which means that it's not a priority. So it's, it's, um, there's other priorities right now. Um, some of you may know that the monarch is present in kind of two populations in the United States, in Canada and Mexico. In the East, it's the traditional one that we all kind of you know, learn about growing up um, here in the US at least, where you've got the monarch that overwinters in Mexico, they breed right about now actually, they're starting to come back up. The females will sort of lay eggs the first generation in the Southern US and then subsequently go up. And then when they get to like Northern US, Canada, that's sort of when they, in like the fall, September, the super generation is born and then those adults fly all the way back to Mexico. On the other hand, we have the Western population. And the Western population is one that is found uh, west of the Rockies and they typically summer and breed throughout Oregon, Nevada, you know, Utah, that area in California too. And at least historically, they have all overwintered on the coast of California not in Mexico. So you can see that very clearly here. So with this, you know, monarchs haven't been doing well at all. So if you go to the next one, this is a graph of the Eastern population. Trying to get it to go to the next slide. Uh, thank you, great, awesome. So the Eastern population has been declining in about 30 years. Um, however, it's, it's fluctuated a little bit more on the end and, you know, in some years, like last year, um, or two years ago, actually, 2019, it was doing a little, it seemed to be like getting a little higher and, and everything like that. So the science on this one is um, definitely clear that it's declining, um, but, you know, from a perspective of listing, you could see, we would sit a little bit easier with the decision um, of warranted but precluded if it was just this one we were considering. However, the Western population is extremely rare, extremely low. So if you go to the next slide, here's a graph of the Western population. And in recent years, almost no individuals have been seen overwintering on the California coast. And a visualization that the Xerxes Society put together, if you could go to the next one, is this here. So this is the Western population. So to give you an idea, they say of the decline of the overwintering population since the 1980s, for every 2,250 monarchs there were in the 1980s, there's one left today. So you can kind of see that lone water, what, butterfly. So this is an example, you know, where obviously we want the service to protect all the monarchs, um, but however, the Western population has a clear, clear need, and it has for the last few years. And if we were able to do two different petitions for distinct population segments, I think that it would have been a no-brainer, I would hope, <laughs> to list the Western monarchs um, immediately. Um, all right. I think that's all we have for you guys today. So we can take some questions along with, uh, I believe Craig and Roel are still on, so they can also take questions as well. 
Yeah, we've got several queued up. Um, I wanted to start with this one that says, Hi, I have friends studying insects in underground and ran into legal restrictions when cataloging insects um, was not permitted by no take laws, as does the process of collecting data about insect populations usually involve um, killing or taking it or can it be accomplished through observation? Um, so if assuming a species is listed um, under the Endangered Species Act, uh, scientists can get a permit under Section 10. Um, you can get a scientific take permit. Um, I've studied a couple endangered species and had to do that. The process is a little rigorous, which it should be, right? <laughs> but very straightforward. So if you do, if you would like to do scientific research, particularly that could potentially benefit um, a rare species, uh, you can get a take permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, alternatively, yes, if you can find non-lethal methods to, to do some kinds of um, sampling, that would, that would be another way too. However, if you are doing it in the habitat, especially critical habitat of a listed species, there's still a chance you could potentially harm it. So um, it would be safer on that, on that regard. And then we've got another question saying, how do you assess the Department of Agriculture's Vilsack's um, receptivity to your no regret solutions? Oh, geez, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a good question. I'm not sure. Well, hopefully it'll be very receptive. Um, but I think um, a lot of these, you know, ideas that we've got, um, some of them will be under the EPA as opposed to the USDA. Um, but the USDA has sort of this uh, farm bill. And oftentimes our organization and other organizations are trying to get more conservation measures in that farm bill. It can be a very political animal. So hopefully, you know, the new administration will be more receptive to such as creating um, what we call CRP land or conservation reserve program land. So farmers basically can get um, money to conserve land um, on, on their property, which I think is kind of a component of the no regret solutions, like increasing habitat on ag land, as well as uh, re restoration and that kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. Um... I actually got a question for Roll a while back and I'd like to circle back around to it. Um, a slide showed dark red, a decrease along the west coast of the US, um, but other data showed an increase in the Western US in general. You might need to um, share your screen and go back to this figure. Um, I don't remember if these slides were regarding richness versus abundance or specific to freshwater versus terrestrial. Could you clarify, is the climate along the West Coast um, unique in this way or does it relate to more intense urbanization? All right, let's try this. You see my screen? I don't see you anymore. Um, was this a slide? Um, well, maybe the question asker could um, submit another question and let me know if that's the slide. So there's this slide and then there's this slide. It says dark red decrease along the west coast. That would suggest a little dark red. Here's dark red. Okay, so the long story short, it's complex. So what we see, especially here at the top, and I think this agrees pretty well with um, with the butterfly. So this is my work, and this agrees pretty much with the butterfly data. There's uh, declines for terrestrial fauna, and butterflies are among the terrestrial fauna. Whereas these increases that you see here along the, uh, especially in the Western US, are the freshwater fauna that are uh, apparently increasing. And this is really a hodgepodge of different kind of studies that have been done. And there has been some restoration, there have been dam buildings. So yeah, it's really all kinds of stuff that's happening there. But the, but the freshwater fauna, do seem to be increasing, but the terrestrial ones are declining. I think I think that would be the, the short story. 
um, and what was happening with those butterflies, especially along the coast, I'm going to guess that that is indeed climate change, uh, something about the climate, and it might just be the, the, what they say is the, that's the autumn temperatures, it might also be the forest fires, um, but there are also some pockets like here in the mountains where the, where the butterflies seem to be doing fine. And then the, the question, oh, sorry, that you're Continue, finished. yeah, please. Um, the question asker was also wondering about um, if the urbanization in those areas um, is contributing to the numbers. Uh, that can absolutely be the case. Uh, at, at the scale that we're working, we don't really know what's happening at individual sites because we it, the, the, the statistics get so complex and so um intransparent actually that i i cannot tell you what is driving this stuff happening at particular sites uh well thank you um i had a question uh for craig peace um that arose um as we humans um, invade further into the Amazon rainforest, do you think it's likely that we will uncover this vault of insects and what effect might that have on human life? Will this have an epidemiological consequences? Yeah, so, um, unfortunately, uh, my view is that um, as humans um, go deeper into the uh, Amazonian rainforest and we're already very, very deep, um, we're not going to uncover uh, this vault of insects. Um, rather, uh, we're going to destroy uh, the vault before we've ever looked inside it. Um, you know, certainly uh, there are going to be um, uh, epidemiological consequences of humans um, invading these new habitats. Um, just as, you know, one example that I, I would hold out as sort of a model of the complexity um, by which these epidemiological um, harmful effects might occur, um, look at malaria. And there's some evidence that what happened there is that as Europeans um, came through Africa, they sort of moved the native indigenous populations up onto hillsides, which, um, and, and moved where the native indigenous populations were uh, inhabiting. And then as a consequence of, of that, those populations were more exposed to malaria. So you look at a case like that, and it wasn't really a change in abundance of malaria, but it was a rather a change in the landscape, which led to more human, you know, mosquito malaria interaction. So we're going to get lots and lots of that. And just think of that as one example, you know, literally out of millions of insects of, of what could happen. All right, thank you. Um, another question. Um, great work that you're all doing. However, to what extent is using the Endangered Species Act playing legal and activist defense and protecting one insect species at a time from harm or extinction caused in large part by corporate plunder due to their political influence of policies and politicians through their acquisition of constitutional rights? Should at least some energy be devoted to legal and activist offense by abolishing corporate constitutional rights that would increase the fundamental legal authority to protect people, communities, and the environment? If so, what do you know and think about the We the People Amendment, HJR 48? I, I, I have some a, comments on oh, the general. Yeah, go on. Please, Craig. I, I, I have some comments on a general level, not with respect to that particular we, the, uh, the people amendment. But my comment is that for me, one of the striking points uh, of this panel has been uh, Raul's really interesting um, observations on how um, complex the story really is and um, all of the 
uh, issues about the different causes for um, insect decline and indeed insect um, increase under different circumstances. And I would contrast that with the discussion about the Endangered Species Act, where I think for me, one of the big takeaways is that it's um, uh, when you try to protect a species under the Endangered Species Act, it's, it's very specific. Uh, to that species, and you need to identify very specific causes. And for moreover, it's a very intricate scientific and legal playing field. Um, and and it seems to me that um, that all of that suggests um, that one should be using um, not only the Endangered Species Act, but the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, climate change policy and potentially, you know, constitutional amendments. Um, I think Roll's um, uh, data seem to me to be a strong case for using the Clean Water Act to protect um, insects. Um, uh, he makes a strong case for using the Clean Air Act to protect uh, lichens and bryophytes. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure about insects. Um, clearly, any advance we can make in climate policy is going to have a positive impact on most of these insect species, you know, save for perhaps a few that are up in mountainous areas. So, you know, I think there's really a need here to um, embrace a full range of legal solutions um, because there's an extremely broad range of proximate causes of the insect decline. Uh, that we're we dealing with. And the, and the broader the legal tools that, that we have, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to match the legal tools with the particular problem at hand. That's a great point, Craig. And um, it, the, you know, it's a little, it's, it's a little complex to be able to say we should use every single law to protect all the insects that need to be protected because the ESA really is the only, one of the only laws um, that we have to actually designate, to actually say this species needs protection. You know, the National Forest Management Act has, um, requires forest plans and some forest plans require management indicator species. Um, and so that's another aspect that we can use to, you know, to help protect species when there's an agency action. Um, and, but, you know, having a species that's listed as endangered really like triggers all of those other laws. So for example, we have a listed um, insect on Forest Service land and the Forest Service is permitting um, an aviary to be uh, allowed on that land. Well, we get to use the ESA to ensure that that aviary doesn't adversely affect that population of listed species. We get to use NIFMA, we get to use NEPA, we could maybe use the Clean Water Act because I actually don't know because I don't know anything about the Clean Water Act, but um, being a listed species under the act really, really helps us use all the other legal tools as well. Yeah, if, if I could um, just expand on that a little bit, um, again, comparing the Endangered Species Act and the, and the Clean Water Act, I, I think it's a really good point that the Endangered Species Act is very uh, species uh, specific. Once a species is listed under the ESA, um, there's a, you know, a, a number of, of um, conservation steps that the service and private parties are required to take, although they might not always do that. Um, but it's very species specific. And, and I guess what I would say is um, uh, keep in mind here that there's some, you know, roughly 90,000 um, uh, species of insects um, in the United States that are known in the scientific literature and maybe double that many in the United States that are, that are unknown. Um, and so the, the Endangered Species Act sort of takes those species and deals with them one at a time. For something like the Clean Water Act, it's not species specific, but what it does is sort of put a bunch of species together, say, you know, well, we've got these um, aquatic species, we're just going to treat them all as a group. So it's more like a statistical approach 
to species conservation. Um, and again, I wouldn't argue for one over the other, but I would just say that, you know, they're both useful tools and that given the number of insect species we've, we've got here and the risks they face, I think we've got to be looking at statistical solutions that, that go beyond um, individual species. And again, that's not a criticism of, you know, efforts to protect one species or to use the Endangered Species Act. Say like um, definitely that would be the ideal, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's kind of very like that's what we want, right? Obviously, we want to conserve as many species as possible. So if we had a sort of more ecosystem-based approach, um, or even you know water and air-based approach to species conservation, that would be great. Um, however, like the way that things have been implemented, um, unfortunately. That doesn't often happen on the ground, uh, you know, like uh, Christine was saying, you know, when they have these management plans or try to meet certain stipulations of the Clean Air or Water Act, you know, the species benefit, um, but mostly it's done, as far as I'm aware, for human health as less so, right, for um, actually species. Uh, that would be fabulous if it was. <laughs> and um, the nice thing about the ESA is that uh, it kind of forces them a little bit to do that uh, with the Section 7 particularly consultations. Um, and if we could get some more concrete either laws or concrete regulations that would require species analysis and actual legal implementation of the solutions, then that would be very good. <laughs> for insect conservation. Yeah. And also, I think, Christine, um, it sounded like you said aviary when you were saying that, but she meant apiary. So like we're having honeybees on <laughs> public lands. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's exactly what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Well, thank you all for those answers. And um, we've got a lot more. Um, Back to the topic of bee diversity, the more the merrier, this question and says, I live in the pine forest of Eastern Washington. And as we begin planting gardens, building water retention systems, et cetera, we want to bring in bee colonies. Is there a risk of threatening local insects by introducing a bee species that might not be native to the area? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just did a panel uh, Wednesday evening, which I think is on YouTube, about um, impacts of honeybees on native bees. So I'm not sure if the questioner is asking specifically about honeybees, um, but generally when people say they want to bring in species, that's usually what they mean. Um, there's a couple, I think there's a non-native mason bee also that people tend to use, but there are native mason bees that you can, you can also bring in. Um, so I would just suggest to check that panel out. Um, Scott Hoffman Black, who is the executive director of the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, um, was on that panel and he gave a really great overview of the impacts to honeybees on native bees from diseases and competition. Um, so definitely, you know, check that out. Cool. I don't know if you, you guys could put that link in there. I don't know if the, for them. Um. Someone is asking, could someone address whether the Endangered Species Act's critical habitat applies to insects? If not, this might be a good start for revision. Yes, it does. Great. Um, let's see. Following 2019 regulatory changes to the Endangered Species Act, Section 7 now requires clear and substantial evidence of any negative downstream effects of a federal action seeking to take authorization. How difficult do you think it is for research to meet this burden? Is it a question of data or of legal and political will? I'd say both. <laughs> it's it's a question of the 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 legal requirements are set at a level where it's extremely difficult to get the scientific data required to to meet those requirements. So you know it's not really either or. It's it's the combination that that gives you the result. 
And then we've got a follow-up question um, to the question that we had earlier about corporate constitutional rights, um, asking if there's any law protecting any species, if that law can be, hmm, if that law can be preempted by corporations saying they have the constitutional right, say under the Fifth Amendment takings clause to mine, drill, or pollute, basically asking if there's a way to affect these changes without ending corporate constitutional rights vis-a-vis -vis the Fifth Amendment. I guess it's a more complicated issue. Yeah, I don't know how to answer this. Okay. I'm just reading these as I go. So apologies if it's out of the, the field that we're talking about. Um, see. Was the um, Eastern monarch population drop in the late 1990s correlated with a change in environmental conditions or was there a change in counting methods? Um, yes, definitely uh, lots of things. Well, environmental conditions for sure. I mean, as climate change has worsened, you know, more severe storms have happened um, during overwintering periods and when migrates, monarchs are migrating. Um, and so, you know, there was one severe ice storm around now in Mexico uh, several years ago that killed something like 30 some percent of the monarchs overwintering. So it's pretty extreme. Um, so that can kind of, that can, those things are happening more with climate change. Um, also, you know, um, so, uh, some loss of overwintering habitat. Uh, um, it's also correlated with um, sort of is kind of early uh, sites in, in the Midwest, um, largely due, you know, potentially to genetically modified organisms or uh, using sort of like Roundup and that kind of thing to kill off plants that can handle that. Um, and uh, it's killed off milkweed and, you know, milkweed is a, a weed. And so it tends to like grow everywhere <laughs> as soon as it's like on the side of the road, it grows, you know, um, but it's not, um, it is susceptible to herbicides. So that kind of spraying also neonicotinoids are a, a very like insect toxic pesticide that started being used more in the nineties and continue to be used today. Um, so that's, there's lots of reasons, you know, obviously just habitat loss um, in, in, in its overwintering areas or, or summer areas as well. So um, death of a thousand cuts, right? <laughs> like Roel said. And then um, one question asker is asking um, what government regulations um, need to be put in place to protect diversity in numbers, sort of um, if there's a proposal in the works or any laws that don't exist yet, but could in the future. Um, I wish I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there are any laws in the works. I'm sure there are. Um, the center has a whole government Affairs Division. Tara might be able to talk more about this, but I would say with the rollback, the Trump's rollback of ESA, um, I think the first step would be to roll that back <laughs> um, to protect, you know, incidental take and um, the foreseeable future issue. And um, he'd all, the Trump administration also rolled back the, um, prohibition to consider economic impacts. And so now there's that. So I'd say that would be the first step. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying also in regards to the ESA to get more funding. Um, you know, it's chronically underfunded. So we're trying to get lots more funding. And then also there's um, a potential bill in the works coming out to ban um, neonicotinoids as well as their friends that are similarly toxic to insects. Um, it's called the Saving America's Pollinators Act, uh, which I think would go a long way to at least address that cut <laughs> in insect declines. Um, and it would also set up a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, like a, a group of experts to then analyze uh, pesticides going forward for their toxicity to insects and specifically pollinators, as well as to do some native bee monitoring, which would, would be great for our uh, dearth of data. Um, Along these, like this question, I was wondering, I don't know, Roel, if you know much about what 
Germany's doing or if you want to speak about um, what the Netherlands is doing. Um, I know Germany's got had some really interesting insect conservation laws uh, being passed lately. Yeah, so the European situation is kind of complex because we do have um, since like 20, 30 years, we have at the European level some protection, but there are very few species uh, of insects actually on that list. As far as I'm, I know, it's, like, it's, it's really a handful of beetles and like really rare stuff. And then every country has its own protection levels um, that are also mostly, I mean, legally, the best thing you can do is to really aim at one particular species, but that of course neglects the rest of the ecosystem. It's you, you hope that this one species can serve as some kind of umbrella species, but that's often like we don't actually know. So um, Germany in the wake of this 2017 paper has come up with a insect protection program for which they shelled out 100 million euros, which sounds like a lot of money, but considering the population of Germany, it is exactly one euro 20 per person. So um, there are initiatives that are trying to do something there, but um, the agricultural uh, ministry is very strong here. So it's very hard to actually change something there. And I think most of this money is actually going to go to um, establishing new reserves and maybe doing a little bit better management and hoping that this will solve the issue. And I, I doubt it will. There's also always talk of banning specific type of pesticides, which is definitely not going to harm the insects. But I also don't think that it's really going to solve the issue because the, the, the landscape as we have it is still um, in an in extremely poor shape. Basically, all the small corners that were not uh, cultivated 30 years ago have now gone under either cultivation or they've gone through some kind of bush encroachment so that none of the pollinators or, or most of the insects can actually use them anymore. So yeah, there's quite some things happening. And in fact, next week, I'm going to go into some kind of um, I'm going to see what the minister is going to present on some of these uh, initiatives. But I am I'm not super hopeful that it's actually going to make a lot of change. Um, in regards to this question, um, we did have this is more of a comment from an attendee saying that the Oregon legislature has SJR five, which, um, if they remember correctly, would amend the Oregon Constitution saying, um, putting in a right to a healthy environment, preserving natural qualities and nature's rights, which would hopefully be a transformative tool for species and people protection. And just wanted to rally for passage of that. I um, was wondering if any of you had comments on um, sort of the effect that similar constitutional amendments in the states or even federally could have, and if that's a, a good avenue that people should be looking at. I think you can make a general point that, you know, we've got a spectrum of solutions and at the one end, you know, there's a specificity of the Endangered Species Act and at the other end, um, there are, uh, you know, proposed constitutional amendments. And, uh, you know, what I'd say about constitutional amendments that, um, uh, you know, propose to create a right for a healthy, um, environment is that um, that sounds good on paper, but the real issue is going to be um, how the courts interpret that um, in specific cases. Um, and at least at the national level now, I think it's fair to say that we have a judiciary that's not going to be well inclined to, to favorably, you know, interpret that language. Now that was, you know, specific to Oregon, so it'll be the Oregon Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, what I would say um, is look at how courts have uh, interpreted other um, constitutional rights that have nothing to do with the environment 
And I think uh, that jurisprudence going back 200 years will give you an appreciation uh, for what will happen with a constitutional amendment like that proposed in Oregon. Yeah, and similarly, Montana has a con uh, constitutional provision um, providing for the right for every citizen to, to um, a clean and healthful environment, um, which was great at the time, but the Montana code annotated over time has really um, removed the teeth from that, um, which, you know, is understandable when uh, Montana is a very resource extraction dependent state and with lots of lobbyists from the oil um, and gas and timber industry. So yeah, I would second what Craig said. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions, but I'd really like to thank all of our panelists and all of our audience for being so spirited and submitting so many questions. Um, it's really great to see so many people wanting to participate. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, this will be recorded and put onto our PILC YouTube, just like all of the panels um, from this week. So I'd also like to promote um, the rest of PILC. It's going to be going on through Sunday. So definitely check out our Facebook to see if there are any events that you'd like to attend. Um, and with that, um, I think we can wrap things up and close out the panel. But once again, thank you all. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.